So first of all, massive welcome to the Level 2 Anatomy and Physiology webinar. My name is Hayley, so this is a parallel coaching webinar and we are looking all about how you can pass your Anatomy and Physiology exam first time for Level 2. So that's an awesome thing to be going through this evening. We are here on webinar format, so it's great to be joined with a variety of you. There's quite a few of you here on the call tonight. Some of you are from our current Level 2 gym group, and that's great to see those names that I recognise. So really nice to see that you can make it tonight. There's also some names I don't recognise, so it's nice to see you and hear from you as well. Whether we've come across you before, whether we've had a chat before or not, this is a real interactive webinar. It's about you guys learning, it's about you guys understanding so that you can pass first time and have confidence. That's what it's all about. So if you can pop a little comment in the chat box whenever you have any questions. If you're struggling to find that that chat box, then just raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll be able to navigate you towards it. But just pop a little comment in the chat box as we go through and I will endeavour to answer questions as we go through. It's going to be pretty well chunked into sort of nine workshops, which will give me chances to hop in and out of questions and then summarise them at the end of each module, really. Uh, so that's our plan. We'll be here for about 60 minutes. So 60 minutes can feel a little bit intense sometimes in relation to learning and keeping that that flow going in your brain. So what is really important is you do everything possible to limit your distractions. So if you need to lock yourself in a room somewhere, if you need to make sure you've got a cuppa already sorted, whatever you need to do to feel totally ready and that this is kind of your time to do some learning so you can be totally and utterly present. One of those things is to turn off your notifications, etc., for your Facebook, just so you don't get drawn into this other world that is social media. So that's a really nice thing to get started on doing. But before you do that, if you could just check in to Parallel Coaching today, that would be really great. So literally go onto your Facebook, check in, say that you're with Parallel Coaching, doing this webinar, uh, and then we'll be able to share for more people in your same situation to join us on future ones. So really, really important that you do that, and I, I'm very thankful in advance. And then once you've done that check-in, literally just close down your Facebook and then just be totally here today. That would be really great. As I say, any questions, pop them in the chat box and I'll get through them as quickly as I can. So this webinar is Level 2 Anatomy and Physiology, How to Pass First Time. So there are some main things we're going to cover as we go through. First of all, it's so that you know what to expect on your Level 2 Anatomy and Physiology exam. Probably the biggest thing that people worry about on their exam is that they don't know what to expect. It's something totally and utterly unknown. So that's really the parts of that we're going to go through. We're going to explore the key areas of all eight modules. So I've broken it down into eight modules, and we're going to use the key areas on each of those. So you're going to get a lot of content tonight, which is fantastic and these are like the real golden goose points these are like the main golden nuggets that you're going to really want to help you with your exam but also your knowledge for when you're working with clients so i'll tie it both into exam and also into coaching and instructing as well so it's about trying out your practice questions as well we'll have practice questions at the end of each module and then we'll be able to go from there in terms of understanding how you answer questions, how you go about reading questions, and this will really help you go in there with some confidence, which is obviously a really important part. But we want to make sure that you have a strategy so that you can pass your exam first time and that you feel totally confident on your exam day. So they're the things that I really want to endeavour that we target on today. If you have any things that you really particularly want to cover, like I said, pop a comment in the chat box and we'll be able to address those as we go. I've also had lots of questions come in beforehand, and I have written those down and I've included them tonight so that we can go through them. Okay, so first off, what do you need to expect for your exam? So what is what, what will happen? What is actually going on on your exam when you do it? So there are 50 questions on the Active IQ Level 2 Anatomy and Physiology exam. There are some variations to that if you're with a different awarding body, but the one we do here at Parallel Coaching is Active IQ, so that's the one that if you're training with us currently on Level 2, that's the one you'll be doing. Everything that I talk about will be absolutely relevant. So there are 50 questions, 
and we need 70% to pass, so it's 35 out of 50 ideally to pass, but they're all multiple choice, which makes everybody relax just that little bit more. Because if they're multiple choice, it just means you don't have to worry about spelling, you don't have to worry about how you pronounce stuff. It doesn't really matter about the great long words as long as you can recognise them in relation to their meaning. So really takes the pressure off a little bit by being multiple choice. There are eight modules. Now these eight modules are basically chunks down of, of information that we need to know in relation to anatomy and physiology. And you can be absolute guaranteed there'll be between three and eight questions per module. And they usually appear in your paper in this order. So in this exact order with three to eight questions. So you already know when you're tackling those questions that it's coming from that section. So you can access that file of your brain and start off and go, OK, cool, I'm starting my exam. I know that the first three to eight questions are all heart and circulatory. And then after that, the next three to eight are all respiratory. That might vary with different exam boards and different exam papers, but generally they appear in this kind of rough order. Heart and circulatory, respiratory, skeletal, joints, muscles, and then there's special populations, energy systems, and nervous systems. So we're gonna cover all eight of these tonight. And rather than me going through the entire manual, I'm gonna literally pull out those key distinction points, the things that are gonna make the difference the things that usually people find the trickiest to understand. And these actually tie in with the questions that you guys have been asking in advance anyway. So this is kind of the, the structure for today. So first of all, before we even go into this module content, I want to talk about whether you have a strategy for your exam. Are you prepared for going in there and getting started and doing your exam? And this is probably the biggest thing. If you think about a gym program, before you go in the gym, you have a plan. You have something that you can kind of go in there and feel confident you can stick to. And your exam should be the same. You should know exactly what you are expecting to do during it, because that will make you feel so much more at ease. It's kind of like a little comfort blanket just to know you have a plan at the beginning. So I would definitely advise you start off by planning your brain dump. Now, a brain dump is something that as soon as you go in your exam, you can write some key areas, some key notes down on your scrap bit of paper. Maybe these are subjects that you particularly struggle with or that you'll particularly um, find hard to remember or it's quite intricate and you've maybe got to all remember orders of things. These are probably the areas that you probably want to have jotted down. You obviously can't take it in your exam with you jotted down, so you need to be able to memorize that brain dump. So as soon as they say your time now begins, you can literally scribble down your brain dump and it will just sit next to you whilst you do your exam. And it's really, really great as a reference tool. The other thing I would suggest is that the night before you eat, drink and sleep well. Really, really important key parts to make sure that you're able to be as focused as possible. And oh, by the way, on drink, I mean water <laughs> or a cup of tea or something. But make sure you're well hydrated and make sure you're, you're totally on it. Also, before you kickstart in your exam, that worst part for nerves is when you're standing outside the exam room or everybody's all getting together in the morning. Don't speak to anyone before the exam in relation to A and P related stuff. So this is things like, oh, is it this ventricle? Is it this atrium? What's going on? Don't go there. Just literally make it nice and jolly, normal conversation, nothing about A and P because your brain will be settled in what it knows already. Then when they say, now time to start your exam, that's when you jot down your brain dump that we were talking about, pop those key areas down, and then just take a look at your exam, start to go through the exam, and tackle the easy ones first. Now leave the harder ones for your next run through. So you're gonna read through it several times, probably, uh, but go through the easy ones, get them done. And then just put, jot down the number on your scrap paper for the, the ones that are a little bit trickier that you want to go back to. The chances are once you've got all the easy ones done, your confidence will go through the roof. You might even find that some questions almost answer other questions in the way they're worded. So it will help you feel a lot more confident about what you've achieved. And then you can go back and look at the harder ones later. You don't have to do them in order. The next thing 
biggest tip I can possibly give you is to read the question. Now we have a specific system that we teach here at Parallel and that's Rebug. So I'm going to share this with you now and this is an awesome system just to give you a way of how to read the exam question because sometimes it's like well what do they actually mean by that? How do I go about answering it? And we then get all in a fluff about what the multiple choice answers are. So we're going to use Rebug. If you've not come across Rebug before, this is it. So first of all, you start off with R, you're going to read the question thoroughly and cover up the answers as much as you can. So just read the question, cover up the answers. Then you're going to extract the keywords of that question. Like what exactly do they mean? Like really think about what they mean, not looking at the answers at all, just looking at the question. B is imagine is for bold, basically. So you can imagine that the key subjects that they talk about in that question are in bold. So you imagine out those key areas, those key subjects in bold, and then you're going to underline the action word. Some questions don't have an action word, but there'll be a gist of it. Are they talking highlight the one that is X or are they saying highlight the one that is not Y? Because these are really, really different uh, understandings. And just make sure you've got the right one before we go any further. So you go bold for the key subject word, underline the action words, and then you need to have a little guess. Guess on what the answer could be. And you're not looking at the answers. Your answers are still covered up with maybe your scrap bit of paper or your hand. And then uncover the answers. If yours is there, that's a great place to start. <laughs> go with that one for now. And then when you go over the question and estimate other answers together once more. So you can kind of have a little look and go back over. So it's read, extract, bold, underline, guess, and go over. So that's your rebug. And it will give you a really good understanding. Now, we have some particular questions going on the whole way through this presentation tonight. So I want you to give rebug a go. Write it down on your scrap bit of paper that you've got with you now. So you know it, you have it, and you're ready to do it. And then when we get to those questions, give it a go. Actually do it, because I'm going to get you to write those answers of those questions in your chat box as we go through. And then you can check and see if we're right. OK, let's get started on some content. Before I do, I'm just going to check and see if anybody's popped any other content, uh, any other questions, etc. in here. Fantastic. So the actual uh, exam time will vary for different awarding bodies, but it's an hour and 45 minutes for the Active IQ one. So there is absolutely loads of time. So just to ver verify that one, an hour and 45 minutes, which is loads and loads and loads of time. And the beauty of that is it takes the time pressure out. You can just concentrate on being there. Fab. OK, thanks for that question, Olivia. So let's go on through and look at module one on the heart and circulatory. As I said earlier, I'm not doing all of the content. I'm literally just going to do the, the big nuggets, the most important parts that we need to do. Fantastic. So from this side, I just want to go straight into heart structure. Now, this is a picture of the heart and actually a really groovy picture of the heart. I have to say I didn't draw it. Mine would look like a box if I had. But from this, I really want you to have a little look. Now, I have not misspelt the sides of the heart on here. When you look at a picture of the heart, the left side of that heart is what looks like our right side of us now reading this or watching this or looking at it. So the way to have a look at it is that you are actually the heart surgeon <laughs> on the names of the heart, ventricles and atrium and chambers, all come down to the heart that it belongs to. So it's your client's heart, it's your patient's heart, not yours. So it's the left side of the heart, not our left side. OK, so right side is what looks like our left side and the left side is what looks like our right side. Now, this one up here is on the top right of that you can see is the left atrium. So atria are at the top and then ventricles are at the bottom. So you've got the, let's have a go through those again, left atrium is where the blood is going to be collected and then that pushes it through into the left ventricle and you can see it pouring down into the left ventricle before it then pumps it back out towards the whole body. 
Then you've got on the other side, right atrium. Notice again, it's the one right at the top. So you know now that atria are at the top. They're the top two chambers of the heart. And your ventricles are the ones at the bottom. Now, the characteristic difference is that atria is the opening. It's the hallway. It's the collecting chamber. So if you've ever been to a theater, your atria is literally the atrium is the entrance hall. That's what these top... Uh, chambers are doing their entrance halls for the blood then it drops down into the ventricle and they're the big strong ones look at all this muscle all the way around the outside these are the big strong ones that push it out into the arteries so that we can move around the body great stuff okay now let's have a look at the blood flow so we're taking this one step further I'm pushing nice and quickly on these and I'll keep on going we'll take some questions at the end what I want you to start off with is up here at the lungs okay so from the lungs we take a nice deep breath in. We're going to go through some respiratory in a moment. When that diffusion of gases happens at the alveoli, they hop over to the capillaries. And now we've got oxygen in our blood. And now we start with the arrow. So now the oxygen's in the blood. It literally follows all the way down and it goes into this left atrium. So just what I was saying a moment ago, but now you've got my box drawing instead. That then falls down into the left ventricle. And then that goes down and serves all of our body via our, by our arteries. Then that comes from the arteries uh, and all of, straight into the body serves all of our cells in our body, all of our muscles, all of our brain tissue, everything, before it pumps it back out. Now, when it's being pumped back out, it's no longer oxygenated. So that's why it's now not red lines, but blue lines, not oxygenated anymore. So the left-hand side of our circulatory system, right as we look at it, is totally oxygenated. And then the right-hand side, which is the left as we look at it, is totally deoxygenated. So it's a really nice key way of remembering what way around we are. So this blue vein takes us all the way back into the, left, uh, the right atrium, and then that takes us down to the right ventricle, which pumps it all the way back up into the lungs, and we do it all over again allows us to expel that carbon dioxide straight out. So from here, we've got our pulmonary vein. Let's add some words to this. Veins only go into the heart, okay? So veins are responsible for going in. They are the vein in, okay, fab. And then we've got these ones down here are our aorta. And all of these arteries, all of the arteries go away from the heart. So A for away. Aorta. They, that's like the tree trunk. That's like the biggest artery that we have in our body. That then breaks down into arteries, which is like the, the bigger branches of a tree. And then the arterioles, which are slightly smaller uh, branches of a tree. And then the capillaries are literally like the tiny little vessels that you have on a leaf, for example. So they're really tiny. They're like one cell thick. Then that transports into the muscle, like we said, and then we go up via the veins because we're going back into the heart now. So the vein in. This time we're going to go via capillaries. So we start at the bottom, up via venules, into veins, and then into the vena cava. And we've got two of these, one for superior, one for inferior. And that hops straight into that right atrium. Goes on down through the right ventricle, back up, and then this is the pulmonary artery right up here before it goes into the lungs. Now, one thing I really want to highlight is that notice these two at the top are classed as pulmonary. The reason why these are classed as pulmonary is because these are to do with the lungs. Pulmonary means lungs. So if you ever learn a language, that's a language for a word for us to learn. Pulmonary equals lungs. Whenever you see pulmonary, think lungs. Now here, you know, pulmonary, and it's on its way into the heart. So it's going from the lungs into the heart. You can map out which one that is. Logic, logical deduction, really. And then this one, pulmonary artery, you know it's going away from the heart and towards the lungs. So you can start structuring it. Now, this is a great one to do a brain dump of when you first get into your exam. Jot it down, draw your squares, draw your little lungs, draw your little, little man, and just draw the lines throughout it all, and you can come back to it every single time. So I also want to go through a quick bit on blood pressure classifications. Now, this often does come up because obviously it's part of your exam. But most importantly, though, why I want to go through it is it's important for your clients, for you guys as 
instructors as soon to be PTs, whatever route you're taking, having an understanding of blood pressure is really, really important because you don't want to be working with people that have high blood pressure that therefore are at risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, kidney dysfunction. We don't want that to happen on our watch, but we also don't want that to happen with our clients. We want them to be as healthy as possible. So the rule of thumb is that the optimal is 120 over 80. And we're safe to work with them if the systole is between 120 and 140, and that the diastole is between 70 and 90. So I always just rem remember it as those particular 120 to 140 over 70 to 90. There's about 20 milligrams of mercury difference on systole and on diastole. Now the other areas to be aware of is that when you come down here and you've got pre-hypertension down here, you've got stage one hypertension starting off after 140, then it goes in stage two hypertension starting off after 160. It's wise to have a look back through this and be aware of your blood pressure classifications ready for your exam. And we go for the highest uh, level. So for example, if they had 120 as their systole, and it was over 95, that would, on their diastole, that would actually push them into stage one hypertension. So there's a quick whiz through on blood pressure. Main thing you need to know for your clients, 120 to 140 over 70 to 90 is normal, good to work with. Okay, you're ready for some questions. For this one, I would like you to use your chat box and I would like you, if possible, to try your rebug out. Try your rebug strategy out so you can cover over the answers that you see on your screen. Now, where does blood flow to after leaving the right ventricle? So after leaving the right ventricle, where does blood flow to? And then just literally pop it in the chat box, the number, so one, and then your answer. So, and then go straight into number two if you're ready. How would a blood pressure reading of 132 over 86 be classified? And then just pop those straight into the chat box. So the answers for number two options and the answers for number one. They're all on screen, which you should all be able to see perfectly. So pop them straight into the chat box. Lovely, we're getting some answers in, which are looking really great. Good variety on a few of them. I have to admit, I've given you two quite tough ones to start the ball rolling tonight, so fantastic. Keep those answers coming in. And just to verify, we had a question come in about the timing of an exam. So just want to verify, yeah, once you guys have finished your exam, you can go. So you don't have to sit there for a whole hour and 45 minutes. So if you do finish early, yeah, go, go and have a coffee. Lovely. OK, so some great answers coming in now, guys. Fantastic. Every answer I've seen so far is perfectly correct. So let's go through these answers. Fine. OK, so number one, the answer is pulmonary artery. So it's saying where does the blood flow go to after leaving the right ventricle? We know it's going away from the from the heart because it's an art uh, because it's saying where is it going after the left, right ventricle? And then at that point. We know it's going to be an artery because it's leaving away from. So that deducts everything else apart from pulmonary artery. We then know that right ventricle pathway is straight into towards the lung. So it's going to be a pulmonary artery A for number one. And how would a blood pressure reading of 132 over 86 be classified? High normal. So it's normal and it's slightly on the high side. So we class it as high normal. So the answers are A and A. So massive well done for those of you that have got those. That's fantastic. So let's go straight into the respiratory system. So for this part, we're going to look at the passage of air through the body. So this is probably the key part of the respiratory system that I want to really tackle with you today. And what I really, really suggest is that you set up a way that you can remember this. Like, for example, a 
a story or a song I'm not going to sing for you tonight, which you'll be really glad to hear because I'm always told off on how bad my singing is. Um, <laughs> but we're instead, try and find a way that you can remember this. And everybody is different. Now, I created a little story, which is Nigel and Mary, who worry about their son, Larry, and Larry is a minor. So I created this story. This might not work for you, but if it if it doesn't, that's fine. Create your own little version that you can remember to help it stick in your head. And then again, you can brain dump that when you first get in the exam. So let's go through the actual pathway that it takes. Nose or mouth to start off with. So we take air in through the nose or mouth. That goes via the pharynx and then via the larynx. That then goes down the trachea. And the trachea is this great big windpipe down through the middle. And then that breaks off into our bronchus, so our right bronchus, or bronchi, and our left bronchi. And then that breaks down into bronchioles, which are like the little tree trunks, so the, so the uh, little branches coming off from the big tree trunk. So you've got your bronchus and then your bronchioles. And then at the very end, you've got these little sacs of air, which are alveoli. And that's where we now allow gaseous exchange between our alveoli and our lungs straight into our capillaries which now allows it to be in our blood so let's think of a way that we can remember this sequence because most people know what that looks like they're quite happy with the looking of it but how do you know which way around to put things so this is my little story again feel free to make up your own nigel and mary this stands for nose or mouth panic that Larry truly breathes bad air. So remember, he's a minor. Larry is a minor. And Nigel and Mary panic. Larry truly breathes bad air. Now, this works well for me. But as I say, make sure you come up with a nice way that you can help you remember this sequence of how air flows through the, the body in inhalation. Now, obviously, for exhalation, the whole thing just reverses. So once you have it once, you've got it sorted. And then you can just reverse it for you if they're asking for something about an exhalation, for example. Now, there are two other key points just to consider for respiratory. And this is your respiratory muscles. Now, it's important to know what muscles are being used when we breathe. Uh, this is also good for us as fit pros as well, because we want to know what muscles are working. And there is a certain level of cardiovascular in what we do with our clients. So we need to make sure that we know what's going on in our bodies. First and foremost, it's the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the great big muscle that we work on in our breathing. So every time we inhale, this sort of dome-shaped, parachute-shaped, thin diaphragm, basically, this, this thin, material, thin muscle right across where our ribs separate in front, all the way back to our back of our spine. And when we breathe in, it gets drawn down, which draws in more air. It creates a, a vacuum. So this muscle contracts, draws down, and allows more air in. As simple as that. Then your internal and external intercostals allow movement to happen around the chest. So they sit in between the ribs. So costal means ribs. So on the word intercostal, costal means ribs. So inter means in between. So it's basically saying you've got two different types of muscles inside your ribs, like in between your ribs. So when these contract, it helps contribute towards breathing and our ability to breathe. Now, without these two sets of muscles, both the diaphragm and the internal and external intercostals, we, we wouldn't be able to breathe at all. So it's really important that we just log that these are the main respiratory muscles that we have in the body. Fab. OK, straight into the quiz. Get on those chat boxes again. Let's go straight through. So during inhalation, where does air flow to after leaving the pharynx? So once it leaves the pharynx, where does air flow to? Is it A, bronchi, B, larynx, C, alveoli, or D, bronchioles? So use that sequence and see if you can pinpoint exactly where it's going to. Oh, we got some good answers coming in. Really nice to see, actually. Really, really great. Fantastic. Yep, you're absolutely right. The answer is larynx. So you're going from nose and mouth, in through the pharynx, down through the larynx. Epic. So B is the answer here. Really, really good stuff, guys. 
Lovely. You guys are getting good at this. I don't think you even needed my rebug at the beginning. You guys have got it really naturally. Fab. Let's keep pushing on through. If you've got any other questions, keep popping them in the chat box. But you're doing really great. So let's move straight into the skeletal structure and function. Now, I want to give you a real good tip. This is probably my favorite tip of some of the stuff that we're going to go through tonight. It can be really hard to understand the difference between an axial and an appendicular skeleton because we actually have two skeletons in our body, not one. So two skeletons. The axial is basically down through the midline. So it's the axle, it's the axial. And this is like the, the main center point. Now, as it goes down through the midline of the body, it only includes the skull, the vertebra, and the sternum, and the rib cage, so the ribs. There are 80 bones there in total. And then your appendicular is basically everything else other than that. Now, the way that some of these questions can be phrased can leave us thinking about whether uh, what kind of whether, whether that bone that they mention, that part of the skeletal system, is that in axial or is it in appendicular? And that's usually the questions that they're asking. Either they'll be asking which of these are appendicular or they'll be asking which of these are axial. And this type of question will un undoubtedly come up. So I have a law for you to remember. It's about the law of ones and twos. If there is only one of them in your body, then it is the law of the ones, and that means it's axial. So we only have one cranium, we only have one skull. We only have one rib cage. Okay, there's lots of ribs, but only one rib cage. We only have one spine. Yes, there's lots of vertebra, but only one spine. And then one sternum. They're all axial. So it's a really nice way of remembering those. And then everything else that we have, we have two of. So we have two hands, we have two feet, we have two legs, we have two arms, we have two shoulder girdles, two pelvic girdles. Now, most people get stuck, if they get stuck at all, is pelvic girdle. They often think the pelvis is one. It's not. If you look at it, you can see how it fits around the sacrum of the spine, and it literally fits around it to be like our shoulder girdle. It's the same sort of thing. It's exactly the same in structure it's just fused which makes us think that it's in one piece but it's not so that's probably the key thing to think about if there's only one of them in the body it's axial if there's two of them in your body then it's appendicular fantastic then when they ask the questions you can literally look at your own body and go do i only have one cranium yes <laughs> and then you're you're solid and ready for your exam so here's another little summary, axial here on the left, you can just see it summarized, and then appendicular on the right. Now this is where you can really see what I was saying about the pelvic girdle and how it's actually in two halves rather than one fixed piece. Okay, we're already on that quiz. Okay, we're flying through these guys, we're doing so well. Pop a little comment in the, in the chat box with your answers. Which of the following forms part of the appendicular skeleton? Use your laws of ones and twos. So think about it. Break down this question. What is it asking you? Cover up the answers. What is it actually asking? Which of the following forms part of the appendicular skeleton? So you know it needs appendicular. And then break it down. Have a little guess. Think about it. Is it scapula, ribs, cranium, or sacrum? And getting some answers in. You're doing fantastic. Lovely. Fantastic. Yep, absolutely right. The answer is A, scapula. We have two of them, two scapulas, two shoulder girdles, for want of a better word. Then definitely A, correct. Well done, guys. Now, ready to move on to joints and joint actions. You are whizzing through these, so keep your brain on focus. We're about halfway through now, and you are doing really well. Now keep, just check in with yourself. Have you been totally present, totally with it? If you haven't, just pull yourself up on it. Ask yourself why, and ask yourself if you can change anything for the next half as we go through this webinar and go through these questions and answers. Just to really use this as a really, really important time for you, just to get your head around and your exam so you can pass first time. That's what it's all about. Okay, let's go join some joint actions. 
Right, lovely. So we're going to go straight into classifications. So before we start, a joint is where a bone meets another bone. So it's two bones together and the joint is the bit in between. Now there are different classifications of this type of joint based mostly on whether they're movable or not. Now I came across a really nice revision tip that one of our learners shared with us today and I loved it. So thank you so much for sharing it. We're going to use traffic lights to help us with this. So fibrous is going to be totally immovable. So this means stop, doesn't it? So totally immovable. Then we're going to go amber for slightly movable, which is cartilaginous. They can move just a little bit because there's a cartilage cushion in between the two bones. But then we've got synovial, which is totally freely movable. So this kind of free movability, we go green is a go. So fibrous is immovable. And they are totally fused together. These are like the flat bones of the skull. And then we've got cartilaginous, which will move a little bit. And really, it's great at impact absorption, which is why we find it in, the ver um, in between the vertebra and also in between the ribs. And adjoining the ribs to the sternum, for example, is right in that rib cage. Now, notice those two examples are they move a little bit or they're totally fixed either way but they're predominantly happening in the axial skeleton we were just talking about. So it helps you kind of understand the differences between the two so that you can sort of work out, well, why do we need that to be fairly stable if it's in the axial skeleton? Well, because that's where all of our organs are. That's where we need it to be the most protective and the most stable to hold everything else in, in relation. So it makes sense that it must be fairly immovable. And, and if it does move, it's only a little bit. Then we look at synovial, and this is about it being freely movable. Now, these are most of our joints that we would think about. These are our fingers, our knees, our hips, our elbows, our feet. They are the main areas that you might think about. Our shoulders, all of that. So then we've got in these, in between this bone, we basically, the, where the two bones meet, we have a sac of synovial fluid. And just think of this as like a, a squidgy thing of gel, basically. And this really does need warming up, for example. So, you know, you do some mobility exercises in your warm up. You're basically just stimulating the synovial fluid to warm up a little bit, which allows us to have nice fluid movement between these freely movable synovial joints. Now, that also has some really special smooth cartilage. We're going to call that higher line cartilage, which is H-Y-A-L-I-N-E. And it lines the, the ends of the bones, basically. And that's so that we don't have any friction between our bone on bone of, our, um, of the two bones moving on the joint. And we get lubricated movement here. Now, this mostly happens in the appendicular skeleton because the role of that appendicular skeleton is that we can move, that we can do the things that we need to do as humans, and as fit pros. <laughs> OK, awesome. So I want to go through the structure of a synovial joint now in a little bit more detail. Now, notice this is the synovial joint. So this is just our really freely movable joints. It's not the fibrous ones. They don't look like this. And it's not the cartilaginous ones because they don't look like this. This is actually an example of just a simple synovial joint. And we're just going to go through the main parts of this. So let's have a look on here. Obviously, we've got a muscle on the far left hand side and you can see that that is crossing the joint. There must be a muscle joining the joint if it's going to move. So a synovial joint must have a muscle that crosses the joint. So let's take our elbow, for example, and we need to know where the bicep is in order to bend that elbow. It must be below the uh, elbow joint and above the elbow joint, somewhere in where it attaches and inserts. So we know that muscle crosses the joint that it's got to move. Fab. Then we've also got a synovial cavity. This is like that, that gooey gel that I was telling you about, where all of this synovial fluid sits. We've got a joint capsule, which you can see is the kind of purpley color right through the middle. Now, in that capsule is where the synovial cavity is, and that just covers the end parts of the bones. We've got a tendon right down here on the left, and this is where the muscle joins into the bone. So it's where the muscle hangs onto the bone. Tendon, muscle hangs on the bone. Great. Then we've got the bone itself. 
So we've got literally the end point of a bone, and the end point of a bone is called epiphyseal or epiphyses. That's literally the last point. Then we've got the articular cartilage, and the other word we used for this is hyaline, H-Y-A-L-I-N-E. You may need to recognise that one, but it's an articular cartilage. It means they articulate together. And also, just looking at this image right now, can you really see how these would potentially, if that cartilage had worn down or we had bad alignment on this joint, that it would really start to wear down one cartilage side more than another? And then that's where the pain starts to appear because all that lovely smooth cartilage is gone. So it's no wonder that people have a lot of damage and uh, problems occur in their joints when maybe they're not holding it in full alignment. So that's why we're so hot on correction and posture and making sure that your clients are moving in the healthiest way for them for long term, not just short term. And then we've also got a ligament in here. So a ligament links two bones together. So the muscles hang on, like tag onto the bone, and then the ligament, uh, sorry, muscles tag onto the bone via a tendon, but the ligaments link two bones together across a joint. So ligaments link, tendons are where the muscles join on. Fab. Okay, so that's our structure of a synovial joint. This is a really good one for you to know. On Active IQ, you won't need to label an image. On some other rewarding bodies, you may well need to. But it's really great just to have this visual image for, so you know what's going on. Let's quiz it. So get on that chat box. Let's have a look through. Go through your read bug. See if you can answer this the most efficiently you can and have clarity in how you do it. Are you covering up your answers? Hyaline cartilage covers the ends of bones in which type of joint? Is it synovial, fibrous, immovable, or slightly movable? I have to admit, this is really easy after what we've just spoken about, isn't it, this one? <laughs> Fab. Okay, we're getting some good answers coming in. Lovely. Okay, so as we just spoke about it, you guys are really easily deducting the fact that this must be synovial, which is really great. And obviously, we wouldn't want it to come from any of the others because the others aren't moving to the same level. Highline cartilage are there to make it nice, smooth transition. So, yes, it's 5A synovial. Fantastic. Lovely. So any other questions you have, make sure you pop them in the chat box as we go through and I'll get a chance to look at those as we work them through. Lovely. OK, module five. Are you ready? So module five, let's look at muscle types and the muscular system in particular. Now, there are three different types of muscles in our body itself. Now, these again kind of feel similar, don't they, to the types we just had of the of the joints in our body. They still have some things that are different about them that we need to just know the difference between. Now, let's start off with involuntary. Involuntary are the only muscles that are smooth in our body, and that's because they have a really weak contraction. They kind of just gradually flow. They kind of make this kind of sequential oozing, kind of undulating kind of um, contraction rather than a big, strong, forceful contraction. Now, you can imagine this wouldn't be very good or useful for us on our skeletal muscles like our biceps or quads because we'd literally like not be able to get any kind of action or force generation. It would just be undulating and weak. <laughs> so involuntary. These involuntary ones and these smooth contraction types, these smooth muscle types are happening in our blood vessels and in our digestive system. Now, most people think of it as they don't even think of that as a muscle. They think of it as like an organ or think of it as our circulatory system or whatever. We don't even translate that to muscle. But the wall of those are muscles. They're just totally different to our skeletal muscles. So this is in involuntary, i.e. we don't have to think about it. Now, good for us, we don't have to think about the fact that our veins now need to open up a little bit more or our arteries need to open up a little bit more, our capillaries do, because we're getting a bit hot. That all happens involuntary. We don't have to think about our um, food digesting and moving down through. We don't have to go, OK, now move it down into my small intestine and my large intestine and then go to the toilet. We don't have to think like that. It just does it. 
So it's involuntary, it happens for us and it contracts automatically. Now we can move on to cardiac. Now this cardiac type muscle, you might go, but it's involuntary, it must be the same as our blood vessels. Wrong. It's involuntary, yes, so we don't have to think about it, thankfully, else that would be a really tiring day, wouldn't it? Literally like 70 times a day turning around saying, and contract, and contract, and contract. It's just not going to happen. So it's involuntary on the cardiac, definitely. That means muscles of our heart, just our heart, okay? Then the difference from this to an involuntary muscle is that it is striated. Now, this means it's just not smooth. It means it's got lines of fiber. And that fiber allows us to have a really strong, forceful contraction so that that can direct the contraction into making a force. And obviously, you've seen the pictures of the heart. You know that there has to be a great big force to push that blood up so it can either take it out of the pulmonary artery to the lungs or out of our aorta into our body. So we know it has to be forceful. And therefore, it must be striated. So there's a clear difference between cardiac and involuntary. Now let's go to voluntary, sometimes classed as skeletal muscle. These voluntary are the only ones that we can voluntarily control, that we can go bicep, now contract. We can't do that with anything else. Okay. Now, like the heart, they are striated, which means that they can contract really, really forcefully, which we need because... At the end of the day, if it's skeletal muscle, it's crossing a joint. Remember those synovial joints, etc. It's crossing across it to allow a contraction, to allow movement to happen at that joint. Now, this happens really strong and forcefully, so that, or at least an ability to have that. But we also have the ability to control it and slow it down. So now you can literally look at your bicep and you can go contract slowly, contract fast. You can control it, absolute control, and that is. That's a fantastic thing that we have as a human, um, something to really be grateful of that we usually just take for, for granted. But all of the muscles that attach to our skeleton and they get there via tendons, that's how they attach on. And they are going to be all the big muscles that you know of via your um, studies through fitness. But also when you're in the gym and you're working out and you go, oh, this exercise works my quads, this one works my traps. You know what you're working. All of those are skeletal muscles and they are under control. They're under our conscious control. Fab. Really good to have a good notice of these differences. OK, we're going to look at the structure of a skeletal muscle now. And this is when we go up a level. We've gone on some surface stuff as well, but this goes up a level. And I want to just make it really, really clear and concise as much as I can. I'm not going to waffle too much. I'm not going to add anything else that you guys need. This is literally the level you need at level two. No more, no less. Simple. So first of all, the skeletal muscle that we look at, that you're looking at now, if you stripped away the skin, it would kind of look like when you get a steak, doesn't it? A steak or a chicken breast or something. It literally is just this this bag of muscle, this flesh, and it sometimes has this sinuousy stuff around the outside, which is just the tendon. That's literally the fascia around the outside covering it, and then a tendon either side. And it looks like on here, you can see on your image on the screen, that the tendon is what's coming out either side as the, te as the fascia is wrapped around the top. Now, we just call this the muscle belly. That's so easy to remember, isn't it? The belly of the muscle, the great big belly of the muscle. Now, this doesn't just contract in one great big chunk because that doesn't make it very adaptable to different forces that we might have or adaptable to different things that we need to do. Or And also, if we then tear that muscle, we're, we're screwed straight away. We need to make sure that we have availability to just contract small units within our muscle. So it breaks down like Russian dolls, basically. One fits inside of the other. So this is the next layer down. A fascicle. Now, a fascicle is this little bit you see shooting out of your muscle right now. And um, this is literally you'll have a multiple of fascicles that build up to be your muscle belly. Now, there is some fascia wrapped around here. Now, at level two, you don't need to know what that fascia is called. But at level three, you'll need to know those the names of these fascia. But we don't need to go there yet. Now, these little fascicles, you can see in each one of them has another compartment. So let's pull that one out as well. And now this compartment is a muscle fiber. So when we're talking about a muscle fiber, 
It's tiny, isn't it? We've got tons of these inside each muscle. But notice these are all running in line. They're running the length of that muscle. So you can see they run in fiber, which is why it looks like skeletal muscle is stripy, because the muscle fibers all run in the same direction. And these my and they're also these are covered in a fascia as well, which we don't need to know the name of yet. And then this part pulls out from here and we end up with a myofilament. Now this myofilament is basically the small contractile proteins just in here that are that allow us to contract. So they are proteins and they come in little lines and together they make up something called a sarcomere. Now a sarcomere is just, just means two myofilaments together just means a little bundle. So that's that little orange bit is the sarcomere. Now the red one and the white uh, and the little other one are called actin and myosin. Actin is the thinner one, myosin is the slightly fatter one. The way I remember this is actin, thin, thin, actin, kind of sounds similar, just missing one, one letter out. So that's how I remember them. You shouldn't need to know those for level two though. Just know that these two are myofilaments. So actin and myosin are myofilament. These are the things that contract, that allow us to make movement, allow us to contract that whole muscle up in a concertina fashion and affects all the other units. So that the juicy bit, the action actually happens at the actin and myosin, which are the myofilaments. Then the muscle fiber moves accordingly and the fascicle moves accordingly, the muscle belly moves accordingly and you end up with movement happened. So as it's all wrapped up in fascia the whole way through, it's like having each different section just clean filmed up, just to make sure it all runs true and in the right, right place. That's all we're doing. So this is your structure of skeletal muscle. Massive well done. Are you ready with your quiz? Haha, <laughs> straight on those, those chat boxes. Do you rebug? Use this as practice, remember. It's really good if you can use all these questions to practice. What joint action occurs when the quadriceps contract concentrically? Now, we've not covered the word concentric yet, but give it a bash, see how you get on. So this is about when the, so break it down. When the quadriceps, so we're talking quads, where do they cross? Think about the muscle, that they, the joint that they cross at. And when that contracts, what do we get? So knee flexion. Knee extension, hip rotation, spine flexion. And then if you're ready, pop that in the chat box and I'll explain number seven whilst we go through as well. Which of these is a smooth muscle? A bicep, blood vessels, heart or quadricep? So make sure you pop those answers in the chat box and we'll have a little look. And if you can say which one you're responding to, that's really cool. Lovely. So these answers are coming in really, really well. And just as another little hint, whilst the last few of you pop in your answers, You've noticed that they both have the same answer in relation to the, the letter. Great, fantastic. So the answer to both of these are B. So if you've written those down, fantastic. Knee extension is what happens when the quads contract concentrically. And then the blood vessels are the smooth muscle. All the others um, are not smooth. They are striated of some sort. Some are in the cardiac, the heart muscles, obviously involuntary, and the bicep and quadriceps are obviously skeletal. Fab stuff. Let's keep it moving. Module six, talking about musculoskeletal systems for special populations. This is often one that people get a little bit stuck on. And we're going to go through a few key points of key special populations that you may be working with as fit pros. Now, this is something that I feel really strongly about in that you guys must feel confident to work with the type of client that you're going to be working with. And you need to know that as a level two fitness instructor, we are not specialists at working with any of these special populations. However, if we're doing a health related program, a basic health related program, then we are able to still work with them as long as A, you feel comfortable. B, they know that you're not a specialist in that area. 
and C, they have clearance either from their GP or their guardian if they're younger adults, except uh, younger adults, if they're young adults or children. So it's about making sure that you're covered and that you're comfortable. So let's dive straight into working with children. Uh, the main point for this, for young people between the age of 14 and 16, we don't work with those that are below the age of 14 with just a level two uh, gym instructor certificate because we need to go into the more specifics of working with children. Now, these guys are not fully ossified. Their, their bones aren't fully formed yet. So we need to be really careful on the type of exercises that we're doing. We want to avoid heavy, strenuous and repetitive exercise. They need good warm ups and cool downs. They need to encourage body weight or light weights only, not really heavy stuff, because we can actually be forcing a fracture to occur in the bone. And because it's not fully formed, it's kind of a little bit bendy. It's like a fresh, uh, a, a green stick that you, if you think about breaking a branch off of a tree, usually it cracks and it breaks really finely and, and cleanly. But if it's a young shoot, it basically bends, whereby it's a green stick. And there's a green stick fracture is where it bends rather than actually fracturing neat. So that's a big danger for kids. We also want to make sure that we're doing higher reps at a lower weight. So go for your endurance rep ranges every time. No need to go into power with these guys. And any stretches should be gentle because remember they're not fully formed and maybe they're not as in tune with what they're doing in relation to their boundaries that they have to go through. You'll know this if you have kids or work with them regularly. It's about their body awareness, hey? Let's have a look at exercise for older adults. There are a key, a few key points that I really want to show here, and that's if you're working with older adults, they class this as 55 plus, which I think is a bit harsh, to be honest, but things haven't changed in that respect. And the reason why they put this as 55 plus is because that's generally the time when whereby little things start happening in our body. We get to a point whereby we're not rejuvenating as quickly as we did or Big changes have happened in the body, i.e. women hit menopause, that type of thing. Stuff changes. And that's why it's classed as older adults for over 55. It doesn't mean we're old if we are over 55. I'll just say that. So let's have a look. The things that aging do to, our, to, do to us is that it decreases our bone density. Now, when it's a small amount of bone density loss, it's called osteopenia. And then when it's a large amount, it's osteoporosis. And that's when it's really porous on the bone. And you can actually see an example of that on the image down the bottom here. You've got your normal amount of, uh, sort of, of bone. And that's kind of like a crunchy chocolate bar. I love chocolate bars. It's related to that. Your normal bones are like a crunchy bar, whereas an osteoporotic bone is like an aero. It's got much more gaps in it, much more big bubbles in it which means that this porous nature means it's just not as stable. So if you put these two chocolate bars on the table in front of you, you'll have to try this later. It's an excuse to buy chocolate. Uh, and then push down equally with your thumbs. You'll notice that the crunchy bar is not going anywhere. It's solid. Whereas the aero just crumbles underneath your thumbs. Now, that's like an osteoporotic bone. It's not as stable. It's more porous because the density is gone. They will have less synovial fluid. And also, they'll be prone to having a decreased muscle mass. Now, when our muscle mass starts to disappear as we get older, so it starts to reduce, this is classed as sarcopenia. Now, penia just means reduction of, and then sarco is like the sarcomeres. It's like the part of the muscle fibers. When I was saying the muscle fibers, the two myofilaments together equals a sarcomere, i.e. it's muscle deterioration. They also get thinning of cartilage. They have less elastic ligaments and tendons. They're more likely to get injuries and breaks and falls. So we need to make sure we encourage weight bearing exercise to ward off osteoporosis. We want to include fall prevention exercises if they're a bit unsure on their feet. We want to consider joint stability and motor skills. Calcium rich diet can help with their osteoporosis. So if you're doing nutrition advice for them, you can factor that in as well. Avoid high impact because obviously you're more like to have breaks and issues going on in relation to the synovial fluid in the joints, things that osteoarthritis might be setting in. So we need to avoid high impact, which is jumping around a lot. And then we want to make sure there's a nice long warm up so it allows time for that synovial fluid to get moving in the, 
inside those joints. Wow, it's a whistle stop tour of older adults. Let's look straight in at pre postnatal. So, for these, I want to look at a little difference between working with pregnant women and also working with them post baby. So, first point on this only work with those you feel comfortable of working with. I personally would not work with a pregnant female, I never have. And I keep it that way because that's where I feel comfortable. I don't know anything about it and I keep it that way. It's not my specialism. Um, however, I've worked with tons of older adults, so everybody has their different things and the places that they want to work with. So it's entirely up to you if you feel happy to work with this population as well. Now, the main thing to think about is about the stability that they're going to have in their synovial joints because they have this hormone which relaxes all of their muscles and their tendons and their ligaments so that they can have greater range of movement in their joints, which they're going to obviously need but it affects all of them. It's not just for the localized area that they need. So we've got to be really careful with things like stretching as well. Now, this is still the same up to six weeks after, and we generally don't train someone until after six weeks post a natural birth. So if they give birth naturally, we shouldn't then be training with them until six weeks after they've given birth. And if it's a C-section or there are complications, it should be more like 12 weeks. However, that may change depending on whether the GP signed them off. Depends on the complications. Then the things we need to think about is avoid high impact exercise, definitely whilst pregnant, but also afterwards, you might want to be cautious about that because the pelvic floor is still going to be a little bit weak. Then we've got to avoid really strong abdominal strength exercises they don't need to be working on that whilst pregnant necessarily. We don't want enforcing anything to happen. And also, they're in a place whereby those abdominal muscles are really stretched out. They're not going to be able to contract fully and allow any kind of range of movement there anyway. Avoid fast changes of direction. Monitor temperature. Avoid developmental stretches, because remember about the hormone relaxing. And obviously, we don't want to lay a pregnant lady on her belly, because, and this is a prone position, because it's going to be a bit like an upside down BOSU ball, um, but also it's unfair pressure on the baby. We also don't want to lie them on their back in the second and third trimester. So this is just due to, due to the pressure of the baby against the artery that feeds it. So it's just about pressure in, in that area. Lovely, so really nice in a nutshell on each of those. Let's now have a look at that quiz question. So if you're still with me and you're rattling on through these, then massive high five. Keep your attention span with me and go straight into that chat box. Go through, let's have a little look. What is the name given to describe the loss of muscle mass associated with aging? So I pop this one in there, we've done it. But I've just popped it in there in relation to older adults. Is it sarcomere, sarcopenia, osteopenia, or osteoporosis? Lovely. Yeah, okay, cool. We're getting some great answers in. I've also had someone pick me up on my my uh, <laughs> my order of answers that I've put in here. So um, yes, we've had lots of A's and B's come through, haven't we, on that all of today so far. I don't think we've had any C's and D's yet. But really, really great. Yes, the answer is sarcopenia. It's the breakdown and loss of sarcomeres, i.e. muscles. So muscle breakdown. Awesome. Answer is B. Let's go into module seven, energy systems. I've had a specific thing to go through energy systems. So it's a specific question in, that I really wanted to make sure I cover with you guys. And it's because a lot of people misunderstand it or it's hard to see it from a manual in particular. So defo going to go through that. Let's start off with the fact that we have three energy systems in our body. And the reason why we have three different energy systems is we need different ways to be able to create energy. Now, an energy system, all it's doing is creating something called ATP. Now, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is just the currency we use in our body to allow our muscle contraction to happen. Remember I mentioned about actin and myosin earlier. These were the proteins right in deep. Your ATP sits on the little myosin heads and it allows that contraction to happen. Now, we need to create that ATP in our body 
or resynthesize it or create it. And we need different ways of doing that depending on the environment that we're in. And that's why we have three different energy systems. So let's have a look at what ATP is, how we create it, and then we'll talk a little bit in more detail about all the energy systems. So here's, here's, have a little look on screen. So first of all, ATP is the top one. It's an adenosine, one adenosine mo molecule, and three phosphate molecules, which together form adenosine tri, one, two, three, phosphate. Lovely. Now, when it's in ATP, we're then able to break away one of those P's. So that's all we're doing. When a muscle contraction happens, in order to get energy happen, all we're doing is just saying, I'll have one of them, and pulling one of the P's away. So as we pull one of those P's away, energy is created. We get this massive spark, and that spark is us using that energy. Done. Dealt with. And then we're left with adenosine diphosphate. So think of that, two phosphates. DI, di, um, adenosine diphosphate, and an extra P. An extra P just floating around, or it might have been used, but we may be able to recycle that later, depending on what we're using in our energy systems. Regardless, this is the difference between adenosine triphosphate, where there are three phosphates, and adenosine diphosphate, ADP, where there is just two phosphates, and the other one's not connected anymore. Now, all we need to do is, if we've got ADP, all we need to do is find ways to stick another P on there so that we can create more energy in our body. We can create more ATP. More ATP we have, the more muscle contractions that we have as well. So our entire function, our entire purpose for energy systems is to get straight in there and create ATP. The more ATP you create, the more energy we have simple, the more muscle contraction we can have, the more things we can do. So that's what all of energy systems is about. As soon as you get your head around that, then you are sorted on energy systems. Okay, lovely. We have three different types. These are our three energy systems that we have. These are our three ways that we create a TP so that then we can snap it off in order to create that energy blast that I was telling you about. First off, let's look at the bottom. I like to do things backwards. Let's look right at the bottom of the screen. This is our aerobic system. Now, this one corresponds to this guy on the cycle. Aerobic system is what I'm using right now. It's what you're using right now. And it's basically the, the space whereby we are able to create limitless ATP with, at really low intensities, as long as we keep ourselves fueled in relation to fats, carbs, and proteins, and we also keep breathing. As long as we do that, we've got aerobic energy and we can keep going all day long. Now, the reason why we might not be able to maintain aerobic is because if we don't, can't get enough oxygen in. So if we take it up to an intensity like a sprint all of a sudden, we suddenly can't get in any more oxygen, and now we've got to work anaerobically. As soon as you work anaerobically, we're no longer using predominantly the aerobic system. We move up into the lactic acid system. Now, this lactic acid system is a little bit different to aerobic because it's working in a way that uses no oxygen. It's just using carbohydrate form. And as it's using that, it's also using a pyruvic acid as well. And, and that creates this lactic acid buildup in our muscles. And if you've ever sprinted for a long time, maybe two minutes, something like that, or you've sprinted at a big intensity, you would have felt it, or you've done a spin class, you would have felt it on your muscles. That burning feeling is your lactic acid building up. Now, that builds up and builds up and builds up to the point that we go, I can't hold this anymore. I need something needs to give. I need to reduce the intensity and go back to aerobic level of intensity. The reason for that is because that's a toxin in our body and we need to keep it fairly short. So the maximum time we can keep in a lactic acid system is like three minutes, no more. Now, if we go into the next system, this is for phosphocreatine system, so PCR, sometimes seen as creatine phosphate. So if you come across CP, I'm talking about exactly the same thing. This is like 10 second movements. It's totally anaerobic. It doesn't need oxygen and it's chemical. All it's going to do is just pop that spare little phosphate that we had hanging around and just chop it straight on to the chain so we end up with ATP again. It's really simple, it's quick, it's effective, 
but it doesn't create very many, whereas aerobic creates loads. So it doesn't last very long. It's like a 10 seconder. It's done and over with. Great, let's look at these in some more details as well in just a moment. I just want to really clarify it in relation to three pans. I'm just going to clarify in this image, this is not my kitchen. I don't have that wallpaper. <laughs> just to clarify. Um, but if you have three pans on a hob, this is like our three energy systems. So think about we are always having them bubbling away all the time. They're just on simmering. They're on a nice low heat the whole time. Now, if we want to focus more on our aerobic, then we just turn up the aerobic pan. Whereas if we're then using something like sprinting or spinning, the others are still going on, but we just turn up the heat on that lactate system. Or if we're doing some Olympic lifts, we turn up the CP system, but we still have the others going on in the background. So it's not black and white. We only use one or only use the other. We are using them all three all the time. However, we usually have a predominant one. Great. OK, let's clarify these in a little bit more detail. Now, here are all three of them. We're going to compare them as we go through. I'm not going to go through this in massive detail, but I just want to reiterate that this creatine phosphate is anaerobic. It creates ATP super fast. And all it uses to do that is creatine and phosphate. That's all it needs. It doesn't create very much ATP, but it's super, super quick at doing it. There's no byproducts, so we could do it all day long really. However, it takes a little while to create it and we don't create very much. However, there is a short duration. It's only 0 to 10 seconds and then it's over with. So we need to be able to have something else in the pipeline so we, we can then make it again and go again. So that's usually why there's big rests in between these high intensity periods you might be doing. If it's cardio based, you're going to be working at an intensity 90 to 100% max heart rate. It is hard. If it's lifting or just moving quickly, then it's just chemical based and you can feel that. That's kind of like a um, an Olympic lift all of a sudden and then drop it, have a great big rest, recuperate and go back in with one great big Olympic lift again. It's fast switch muscle fibers. Let's go straight in with lactic acid. This one is also anaerobic and it's kind of the middle ground. It's fairly rapid at ATP production, but this time it creates a lot of byproducts like we were talking about earlier. It uses glycogen, which is obviously carbohydrates stored in the muscle. Then it's also only really up to about three minutes maximum. Two minutes on the average person, about three minutes maximum that you, people can hold that lactate threshold that can stay in that lactic acid system before the, they need to lighten the load. Now, this is also anaerobic. Before we go, the only one that isn't anaerobic is the aerobic system. And this one is unlimited. We can create this all day long, but we do need to have carbohydrates, fats and proteins and oxygen available to us. And we need to make sure and we have some byproducts, but they're not toxic to us. So carbon dioxide, we just breathe out. Heat, we just sweat out or cool ourselves down, maybe. And then water, we just go for a wee or sweat. Easy. And we can keep this going all day long as long as we want, as long as we keep that intensity low enough that we don't hop into anaerobic. And these are slow twitch muscle fibers. Wow, okay, let's go with that quiz again. Go straight in and have a little look onto the chat box. Which energy system would be used primarily during a 30 minute swim? So you might have to think about, okay, how long are they swimming for? And Break it down. What do they want to know? Which energy systems for a 30 minute swim predominantly? Glycogen system, adenosine diphosphate system, creatine phosphate system or aerobic system? Lovely. <laughs> Keep those answers coming in. Fantastic. The answer is D and you're right. It, it isn't B. So all the answers are, haven't all been A and B tonight. This one is a D. Fantastic. So aerobic system, because it's more than three minutes, we've got to be able to maintain it. 30 minutes swim. Fantastic. Right. I appreciate I've been more than the 60 minutes I said, but we've got one module left. And the nervous system is fairly small in terms of the content that we'll be covering tonight. So if you can stay and stay with me, that would be really great. And just keep playing full out. Let's go. 
Okay, in terms of the nervous system, you can break it down into loads of different sections. We know we've got the central nervous system, we know we've got the peripheral nervous system. But what I really want to talk to you guys about in particular is the types of contractions that are stimulated by our nervous system. Because this is something that usually people get hung up on or a little bit stuck on in relation to nerves. Now, let's start with isometric. We're going to talk about the different contractions that can happen in a muscle. Now, if you look at your muscle, your skeletal muscle, and look at your bicep, for example, or your quad, when we contract it, generally we assume that that must create some movement. And nine times out of ten, we contract it so that we can have movement in that joint. However, sometimes there's a need to have an isometric contraction. So like you're holding shopping out to the side or, or trying to like hold grip on something, you're basically creating a contraction whereby the muscle stays the same length. So just contract your bicep now and keep the length of your bicep the same. So the joint doesn't change in, in angle, but your muscle is definitely contracted. You get a bit of a pump on on your bicep. Now, this is isometric. It means it is the same length. So metric meaning measurement of length. Is it metric? Um, and is meaning is the same is the same length. So it's the muscle is staying the same length the whole time. It's isometric. This is like a plank position, or you might do an iso squat against the wall. That's where those things come from. It's the same length. Now these are the two that people get confused on. When that muscle is moving, there are different words for whether that muscle is contracting concentrically or eccentrically. Now the biggest part of this is that. It is um, that on concentrically, the muscle is coiling up. It's getting shorter. Now, it's the length of that muscle that matters. The length of the muscle that matters. So take a bicep curl. Hold your pen now. Your pen that you're taking notes with, just hold it. Write down like you're doing a bicep curl. A nice straight arm to start off with. And then curl it up really gradually. Now, what's happening to your bicep is that in that lifting phase, as it's lifting up, your bicep is coiling up, it's getting shorter. And as it gets shorter, the load moves up towards the clouds. The loads in this instance being my pen <laughs> or whatever it is that you're following along with. I hope you're following along. And then as that's pulling up, your muscle gets shorter, coils up, but your, your weight goes up towards the clouds. And that means it's concentric. So there are two ways of remembering concentric movement and that is concentric contraction of the muscle, and that is that the load goes to the clouds, i.e. C for concentric, C for clouds, or that the muscle coils up. Both of them begin with C, great way of remembering it. Now, on your bicep curl, let's go back to there, go back to your bicep curl. This time, instead of holding it at the bottom to start, imagine you've done your, your concentric phase and you're at the top of your movement. Your elbow's as bent as it can get. And then you want to gradually lower it back down. Now, some people think that the triceps doing that work is not. It's basically the, the muscle that's tight and contracted is your bicep, isn't it? That's the one that's got the pump on. That's the one that's moving. So from here, it's then got to gradually release that contraction and get a little bit longer. So as that muscle lengthens out, the muscle is elongating. Think E, elongate, E, eccentric. Lovely. And then you also notice that the weight goes down to the earth. So as the weight goes down to the earth and you get to move eccentrically, you, you're basically in that eccentric motion whereby the bicep is contracting and lowering down or elongating. Nice. OK, good. That's the difference between concentric and eccentric. Now, I want to briefly go through role of motor units because a motor unit is basically a motor neuron and motor neurons are the ones that are the nerves, basically, just nerves that serve from our central nervous system out towards our muscles. They're the ones that tell us to do the work. They're the bosses that are standing there from the central nervous system and telling us, move that muscle. So now you're, if you ask your bicep to contract, your motor ner nerve is traveling down from your central nervous system, from your brain, and saying, I want this muscle to contract. And it's telling you to contract, and it innervates it. But it doesn't innervate the whole muscle belly. It just innervates individual muscle fibers. 
Sometimes it'll innovate one or two, sometimes it'll innovate three or four, whatever. But that will be already ingrained. So for that bicep, for example, one motor unit might be just the motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innovates. So it might innovate five, for example. In your quads, you might have one motor neuron that innovates 10 muscle fibers, for example. They vary from muscle to muscle, but they never change within a set motor unit. So a motor unit is a motor neuron and all the innovated muscle fibers. Now, in order to change that, we could change the load that we're lifting, we have to recruit more motor units to create a stronger contraction and innovate more muscle fibers. I can't turn around and say, oh, well, I'll have a bit of that muscle fibers that are innovated and I'll have a little bit of that one it's all or none and you'll hear of this being told as the all or none law the all or none law basically means the motor unit is either on or it's off that's it no variables in between it can't be partially contracted if we need more load if we suddenly take the weight up on the leg press we suddenly need to recruit more motor units done fantastic good stuff Here's a little picture. We've got a central nervous system, motor unit going across, and then innovating the muscle fibers as well. Let's quiz it. This is our last quiz for tonight. You guys have played full out. Let's see if we've got uh, any more A's and B's in here. <laughs> okay, good stuff. So, when a muscle contracts without changing length, it is undergoing a which type of contraction? So, it's not changing length. Remember, really read that action word. What is it after? Is it eccentric, concentric, isometric, or isotonic? And then your final question, question 11, is which of the following describes the all or none law? When all the muscle fibers innovated by a motor neuron contract, when all the muscle fibers innovated by a motor neuron relax, when all the muscles of the body contract at the same time, when all the muscles of the body relax at the same time. So let's get those questions in. It's our final one. You're doing great. Lovely. I love seeing these answers coming in. You guys have got probably all of them right today. I haven't seen a, a wrong one yet. <laughs> really, really good. Keep them going and also start getting those questions in. If you've got any other questions that you want me to cover later, make sure you pop them in because then I can go through them in the time we get to questions and answers in a moment. I'm not, I'm not far off there yet. So, uh, lovely everyone's getting them right this is fantastic you guys absolutely rule so question 10 yes the answer is c isometric remember same length and then for question 11 yes the answer is a we had to have another a in there somewhere didn't we so which of the following describes all or none is when all the muscle fibers innovate by a motor neuron when innovated by a motor neuron contract fab Okay, lovely stuff. Get those questions in ready and we will start to move forwards. So just to clarify on the question 10, there is a little disturbance between the difference of what isometric is and what isotonic is. Isotonic means same tone and, that, or, or, and actually relates usually to same um dilution in relation to sports drinks so isotonic we would have heard of that before comes up generally in sports drinks isometric means same length think same length lovely stuff well done guys get those questions in because we're about to move on to questions and answers at the top of the whole webinar so far your absolute patience and concentration tonight has been immense and a massive tip my hat at how many you guys have got right i'm really really impressed Hopefully you're integrating all of your rebug as we go through. Uh, I have answered questions as we've gone through about the exam itself. A few people have been asking about the time that the exam will be on for. As I said, an hour and 45 minutes. If you have any more questions, you can contact me directly. So if you don't want to put them here or you think of it suddenly later, then email me info at parallel hyphen coaching.com 
and or you can reply to one of the webinar emails that we've sent you. We'll send you another one after tonight. Just hit reply, pop your question in there, and it will come straight through to me. And it's a really nice way that I can I can then go through all your questions. Lovely. Okay, fantastic. So one question coming through about our revision mastery series. Now our revision mastery series, yes, you're absolutely right. If you've enjoyed this tonight, um, it is literally an elongated version of this. You've got about an hour on all eight of the modules that we've just done. So the guys that are on our level two gym qualification at the moment are currently doing their level two revision mastery series and they've had it on their mp3 players on their iphone whilst they've been walking around doing work etc so it's a really nice way of having content just like this but straight in your ears and for longer in full detail so yes if you're interested and you want to go the next step in understanding this and you're not already part of our revision mastery series then I've got some links for you, which I will share with you, and we'll pop in the email that you'll get this afternoon, uh, that you'll get straight after this webinar tonight. Just want to really clarify as I go through that the 88 mock questions is also a lovely place to go to next. So if you kind of like doing the questions and you like the the, the testing element of it then the 88 mock questions is for you because they are free. You can download them. I'm going to pop this same link in the chat box so that you guys can get hold of it. And you'll have it in the email that follows after this webinar so that you'll, you'll get an email later with the replay of this video and the 88 mock questions opt-in for you to, to grab hold of. Good place to practice what you've already learned and practice your rebug. Now that's totally free and then the level two revision mastery series is a series of videos so it's all videos it's not just not audio at all they're all video based and they allow you to have all eight modules in this similar format so if you've really helped you learn all the ins and outs of it then that allows you to get this similar kind of format and you can get to that on our revision mastery series it's usually 97 pound but we do have an offer on at the moment so if you guys are interested go to this uh, this exact same URL which I'm going to pop in the chat box for you now so this is the 88 mock questions one and this one's coming into the chat box for you now and then the final one is for the revision mastery as well And I've got someone already asking me, which is great, about the particular discount we have about the Revision Mastery. Nice to hear that you're interested. The discount that we have on the Revision Mastery is 62% at the moment, so it's loads down. And make sure you go and check those out. Fab. So you should now have these in your chat box. Lovely. So you should now have both of those in your chat box in terms of the little links. Fab. So if you need to follow those, then please do go there. Any other questions, please get them in. Um, the other thing I will say about these two extra things in terms of the 88 more questions and the revision mastery, if you've got any questions, please do just contact me um, because like I said, there are often lots of questions that come up when you're revising for your exam, getting ready, maybe getting a little bit panicky. Whatever it might be, just give us a shout. So info at parallel-coaching.com. If anybody has any other questions, pop them in the chat box. Other than that, we're going to close it up in about a minute. So please do pop those in. Just want to say a massive well done for all of you in the in the last hour and a half playing full out tonight those of you that are on the level two gym course at the moment um i can't wait to see you in about 10 days time or so where we're going through your your exams and we've got your practical assessments and we really get started as fit pros i hope you're really looking forward to it too i'm looking forward to spending the whole weekend with you those of you that um i've maybe not met yet before if you've got any questions info at parallel-coaching.com and I can't see any of the questions coming in, so we're going to leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much for your attendance, and have a lovely evening. Take care, guys. <laughs>